Hello, how's everyone doing? All right? Um, so um, today I'm going to talk about um, how to save the internet, a big topic. I know it's something that actually a lot of you here work in this industry and are thinking about how to uh, improve the internet, how to get our culture, our society um, on the right track. Um, I think the internet is at a real crossroads right now. On the one hand, it can feel like a flaming dumpster fire. On the other hand, it's something that we love, that brings us joy, that makes us feel uh, connected to other people in the world. Um, and I feel like at this particular moment, we are really at a crossroads where we're trying to figure out how to pick the right path to help the internet be what, uh, live up to its potential and to benefit society and, and to bring people joy uh, and to bring people truth. Um, but it's been hard recently. Um, it's been hard in digital media. So um, a lot of digital media companies, um, including BuzzFeed, have had to reduce costs and reduce staff. It's been a painful time. A year ago, um, I wrote a memo to my own staff saying that the media is in crisis. Um, unfortunately, that turned out to be true. Um, and there has been a lot of struggles in the media industry. But something surprising has also happened over that year. Um, something unexpected happened, which is that that crisis has spread not just from digital, me to, to, from, from digital media to society as a whole, um, to our culture. Um, and so we've never been more connected, um, but we've never felt more divided. Um, people, people feel, despite being connected to, to each other, they don't, they don't feel um, like the, the, the things that are supposed to be connecting us sometimes make us feel more isolated. Um, and we've never had access to more information, but it's harder and harder to figure out what's true, and um, we never needed truth more. Um, and so what's happened in the last year is that the crisis that started in digital media has spread to the tech platforms. If you think back a, a year or two ago, the tech platforms seemed all powerful. It seemed like they were never gonna have a crisis. They were printing money, they were growing, they were hiring, um, and their business is still strong, but they're having huge problems with the content that lives on their platforms. Um, Anti-vaxxers, pedophiles, trolls, um, fake, uh, people just making things up and posting fake news, saying the Pope endorsed Trump and things that are just completely false. Um, the, the platforms don't make content, and they're having trouble controlling the content that reaches the public, and they reach billions of people. And so this has become a real crisis for the platforms, to the point where uh, today Elizabeth Warren was saying she wants to break up the platforms as part of her political um, um, platform. So there's a, a real sense of crisis in Silicon Valley that the way consumers interact with their services is through content, and they have very little control over that content, and they, and they have, are having a lot of trouble maintaining the integrity of that content. Um, so there's an obvious solution. Digital media companies don't have enough revenue, but they make tons of great content. And tech platforms have tons of revenue, tons of profit, but they're having a lot of problems with the, um, with the content that lives on their platform. And so there's an obvious solution of the tech platforms and digital media companies working together and working together to solve these problems for society and working together to solve these problems in their respective industries and businesses. Um, and so we can work together to fix the internet, and I, and I think that the good news is that we are um, we, we're, we're starting to make progress on this. But one thing that is important to make progress is we can't just police bad content. If you think about um, the tens of thousands of moderators that companies like Facebook and YouTube are hiring, um, they're trying to get rid of all the bad stuff, and it's an endless fight to get rid of all the terrible content that's uploaded to these platforms, and they can never win this fight. There's a vacuum of, which is created by a lack of good content, and it's made it in, difficult for, for um, the platforms, and it's opened up this opportunity for all these other bad actors to upload content. It's much, much easier to actually create an ecosystem where good content can thrive. If you do that, there's less room for bad content, there's less room for bad actors, um, and you actually have more ability to um, connect with your audience and, and give them things that they really like. Um, and so, um, 
I think it, it you know, I know, I, I know and spend time with the people at the big platforms. They're good people. They have families. They care about the issues that are on their platforms. They're not anti-vaxxers themselves. Um, they don't, um, they, they, they don't want the, the, you know, the, the terrible content to be on their platforms. And so they're spending literally billions of dollars trying to hire people to, to moderate the content. But a much simpler and better solution um, is to also create models for good content to thrive. So um, the good news is we're, st we're, we're starting to see progress here. We're at the very beginning of the, of the digital media companies and the platforms working together in a productive way to create a strong ecosystem for, for content. So I'm going to give you some examples from BuzzFeed. And these examples um, will illustrate things that you may see in your own business or, 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 or in the industry that, that, that you work in. Um, but one thing that, we, um, one thing that we've seen um, is that the platforms are starting to pay for the content that digital media companies are producing. They're starting to, we're starting to get closer to a fair, uh, fair payment for all the content that we're producing. Um, in t um, Q1 of 2018, um, BuzzFeed made $500,000 for the video we were uploading to Facebook. This video reaches hundreds of millions of people, and we only made $500,000. Um, but by Q4 of 2018, it, it was $3 million. That's a lot of progress. Um, if you look at YouTube, um, back in January of 2017, um, only 30% of our videos were monetized. And by November of, of, of last year, 70% were monetized, meaning the fill rates were, were going up and improving. Um, and so in, in, in just five years, we've seen 12x improvement in platform revenue from, 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 these, from these companies, up to uh, 84 million last year. So that's a, that's a lot of improvement, and it's something that's very encouraging, and it shows that the platforms are starting to realize that having quality content, having quality digitally native content on their platforms is important to their business and is key to their future. Um, um, we also have had to do our part at BuzzFeed of measuring our content much more rigorously. Because the economics of the platforms are still pretty tough, we need to really measure carefully the cost of making the content um, and the revenue that we generate from the content. So just to give you a little bit of um, explanation about this chart, each circle is a different content group at BuzzFeed. And um, the buck um, axis is how profitable, it's a profitability metric of the content. Now we have all different production um, models for content, so buck is a way of normalizing across things like our website and video and distributed. Um, and then BAM is an attention metric, because all the different platforms measure attention differently. Time isn't measured the same way on YouTube or as, as Facebook or as Snapchat. We've created a normalized way of measuring attention. And so this chart shows where people are spending time and attention and how much uh, profitability it's generating for the company. And just by being able to measure all of this, we are getting better at understanding how to profitably operate different kinds of content, different kinds of content divisions. Um, and not everything is profitable now. That, that one number sort of shows where, where the dividing line is. Um, but we're, we're seeing um, real progress here, and it's, um, it's been requiring us to really think very rigorously about how we manage our, our content and our content portfolio. Um, so, so we've made progress here, and 84 million in revenue is a lot of revenue, um, but it's not enough to... To, to reach all the people we reach all around the world with video and entertainment and lifestyle media. Um, and so we need to find other ways to grow our business and sustain our business. Um, and so I'm going to share some of the things that we've done. Um, we've we've um, been focused on, on finding ways to generate revenue without the platforms. And so um, in, 19, um, in, in 2018 and 19, we'll have generated 200 million in revenue streams that didn't exist in 2017. And I think this is a, will be familiar to any successful digital media company, because to be, succeed, you need to continually invent new products. You continually need to find new ways to, to grow um, um, your business. Um, a few examples of this, um, we, uh, of new things that we have, have, have just launched. So um, this example is a brand safe network that we have just uh, recently launched. Um, one surprise to me, when you talk about saving the internet, is that brands have stepped up in a major way and are contributing to improving the quality of content on the internet. Brands have a lot of, of, of pull with the platforms, 
they can tell them we don't want our ads to be on, on this kind of content, and they've had a big impact on improving the quality of content on the platforms. And brands have had a big impact on partnering with BuzzFeed and other companies to do things like run their um, campaigns across a brand safe network of our content to reward content that actually is positive and content that actually um, helps um, improves people's lives and, and has um, um, a beneficial impact on society. Um, and so our brand safe network is another way for brands to do that. They can advertise across Facebook, YouTube, BuzzFeed. This is an example of Tasty. So BuzzFeed's Tasty um, is, is a, is a, uh, has lots of great uh, food content, and a brand can partner with us to, to advertise across all these different platforms only on brand safe quality content from Tasty. Um, product showcases is another new one we're just launching. Um, BuzzFeed has a huge affiliate business where people are finding shoppable posts and gift guides. And we wanted to give an opportunity for our advertisers to be able to go get into the mix on, on product showcases, uh, which is a, a product called Product Showcases, where, where, um, where um, a brand can put a sponsored product inside of one of our shopping posts. Um, and one thing we're seeing on the internet, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, is just this shift towards transactions, a shift towards real world action, and a shift towards activity. So with BuzzFeed, you can drive awareness for your product, but you also can, can uh, drive direct conversions um, through product, uh, like, uh, product showcases. Um, and then creators, um, there's been a big explosion in influencer marketing. One of the challenges of influencer marketing is that influencers are fairly isolated. Often they live, they don't have studios, they don't have coworkers, they live in, you know, they're, they're working out of their own apartment. Um, and so what BuzzFeed did is, is we created a program within BuzzFeed where BuzzFeed employees and BuzzFeed producers and BuzzFeed creators can become influencers and creators and work with brands and it combines the power of this human connection and personalities with the strength of BuzzFeed's larger media network. So you get the scale of a, of a big uh, digital media company combined with the personality of, of, of an influencer. And this is something that's been growing really quickly for us. We've been working with a lot of great partners on it. Um, and then consumer products. So uh, Tasty was a really interesting example of, of, of building something huge on the platforms and not really generating much revenue from the platforms. And so we had to really hustle and figure out our own ways to generate revenue from Tasty, which is the internet's largest food brand. We um, launched uh, Tasty Kitchenware with, with Walmart. And so we have a full 100 SKU line of kitchen products available at every Walmart. Um, with Goodfall, our, our, our healthy living uh, brand, we launched a line of homewares with Macy's. Um, and then we also did an innovation sprint, which is something we've been doing with some partners with Scott's miracle Grow to create and launch Lunarly, which is a subscription gardening product that is um, now doing millions in recurring revenue and, and growing. Um, so this is, uh, so, so the platforms, the improvements that we're seeing on the platforms with platforms sharing more revenue, combined with innovating and creating new businesses on our own, are really building a strong foundation for digital media. There is a lot of, um, uh, skepticism right now in the market for digital media. A few years ago, there was a lot of exuberance and, and people were maybe overly optimistic about digital media. Now they're overly pessimistic about it. And I think that if you see what the changes that are happening on the platforms and you see the businesses you can build with digital, um, there is a really strong um, future for digital media. Um, and it's a future that we are very excited about. Um, and that um, opens up the Next part that I wanted to share, which is um, once you have a strong business foundation, you can do what we, what we do best, which is make good content for the internet. The internet is, um, um, we love the internet at BuzzFeed. I know many of, of you love the internet. We want to fight against the dumpster fire and push forward to joy and truth and make great internet content. And we think a lot about how do you do that? How do you fill this, this void? Uh, that, that has opened up, not with problematic content, but with content that really connects with people. And I'm gonna share a few examples of the kinds of things that we do. So the first uh, principle I wanna share is that you should make good internet content, not shitty television. A lot of digital media companies have made the mistake of pivoting away from the internet and try, folk, trying to become TV production companies, um, or of making internet content that kind of looks like low, cheap, 
uh, television content and putting that online. Um, it is not a good strategy for digital media companies to, to, to make uh, things that are sort of like low-end television. Um, there's plenty of great TV companies. Um, you can, TV can be, can, be, can, be, can be wonderful, but there's special things that you can do on the internet, and there's ways you can connect with audiences on the internet that just aren't possible in broadcast and aren't possible in, in, in TV. So let's not do uh, shitty television. Let's make the uh, really good internet. So how do you do that? Um, here's a few examples. One, uh, this is our AM to DM show on Twitter, which is a, our morning show where the hosts are in the mix on the live conversations on Twitter. They do a segment called Fire Tweets, of tweets that are happening during the show. Um, and there, it, there is a um, two-way conversation between the audience um, and, and the conversations that are happening on Twitter. Um, this is Cuppy. Um, Cuppy is one of BuzzFeed's most successful influencers, even though Cuppy is an animated cupcake and not an actual person. Um, Cuppy is... Uh, was uh, grew to two million followers in less than a year, and I think um, um, the big part of that growth was the connection with the audience. When Cuppy got a, uh, adopted a little kitten, um, we asked the audience what the kitten's name should be, and three, 36,000 people commented um, that uh, and voted on the name. There was tons of arguments about the name, and the name Sprinkles won. Just so if you if you were, if you were wondering. Um, this isn't something you can do on, uh, in t uh, on television. This is something that you, you need the internet to do. You need that kind of, of, of two-way connection. Um, another great example is, mu um, is uh, multiplayer, where our creator, Kelsey, is taking the Sims 100 Baby Challenge. So Kelsey has created a Sims character that is trying to have 100 babies. Um, she asked the audience to create eligible baby daddies for her. Over 100 eligible dads were submitted. Um, and then her character, Chelsea, um, started to have babies um, and announced the challenge. Um, 13 million YouTube views on the, on the first uh, announcement. Um, she is now up to 10 babies so far. Um, if you um, go to multiplayer on, on YouTube, BuzzFeed's multiplayer, you can um, watch for the next uh, uh, 90. Um, and our audience helped build a new house on Twitch for the family. So the audience was actually creating the house that, that, that uh, that um, Chelsea and the babies live in. Um, and so when you look at something like this, it's an example of a way that um, the internet is just weird and, and, and magical and creates two-way conversations and allows you to do things that you just never would be able to do in traditional media. And it's the reason why all these trends that you, you, you're seeing of cord cutting and people shifting to, to digital and spending more time consuming media on their phones is because of this kind of connection. It's because of these things that, that, that spark joy and allow people to be part of the story. Um, we also lead online debates, where the audience is a huge part of the, of the content. Um, we um, ha uh, recently had a post, help us solve this debate, about what the um, H in IMHO stands for. So um, this started on our company Slack, uh, where Lauren said, hey guys, what, what does IMHO stand for, like IMHO? Um, and then basically people started weighing in. The H stands for honest, humble, honest, 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 uh, humble. There's a huge debate. So how can, we're an internet company, how can people n disagree about something so important and so fundamental? So what does the H stand for, honest or humble? Let's just do a quick show of hands here. So who thinks, are you guys ready to raise your hand? I know it's a change, I know it's a change to, to, to have to move your body. All right, so how, <laughs> how, uh, how many people vote honest? Let's see. All right, all right. And how about humble? Let's see. Oh, a little, little, little more humble? Okay. So, um, so uh, the internet audience, 57% uh, said honest, only 43% said humble. Um, however, um, if you were a sort of older millennial or Gen X, you're a lot more likely to say humble. Um, and, uh, and if you are uh, a youngster, you're more likely to say uh, honest. Um, so, um, you know, not that we want to have a generational war, like, right here uh, in this ballroom. Um, so, uh, uh, um, another, key, another key to creating great internet content um, is, is thinking about how the content serves a function in people's lives. 
So we have a project internally at BuzzFeed called Cultural Cartography. We also sometimes will call, we have a, a, an email list that's similar that sends things called hot frames, which is another kind of way of getting to the same concept. Um, but we look at the job the content does in someone's life. So if you think of the traditional way of organizing content, it's around things like, is it about sports or politics or media, um, what the content is actually about. We look at content from the perspective of, of what job does the content do in someone's life. Um, so this takes me back. Um, this is us. This is so true. Um, this is my fandom. Um, um, uh, goal, hashtag goals. Um, you need this. Um, and we started to categorize a bunch of, of, of different jobs that, that Cognitant could do, including um, which jobs tend to overlap with each other. Um, and that helps us think through how to make content on the internet where communication and content have really converged. When you are consuming content in traditional media or on print, you're really just thinking about consuming the content. On digital, you're thinking about who am I going to share this with, how am I going to use this to communicate who I am and what matters to me to other people and people in my life. Um, and so um, here's some examples. Job, you are not alone. If you were stabbed by a pencil and still have a mark, you are not alone. So another show of hands. How many people here have the pencil mark? I want to Oh my God, look at that. After, say, so after this session, can all those people meet in the back corner over there? <laughs> and uh, you guys can, uh, can, can talk about, you know, have like a little support group. Um, so, um, so there's things like this that are just, that, that are a perfect example of the internet connecting people and making people realize that, they're, that, that, that there's other people like them in the world who've had, had something, even if it's something as trivial as this. Um, or, um, or a job, this is us, 28 cheap and clever DIYs for anyone who raises chickens. Wait, should I ask how many people raise chickens? I wasn't even planning to do that, but like, does anyone here raise chickens? Is there anyone? Oh yeah, there we go. We got one over here, another one over here. So there's not necessarily that many people who raise chickens, but if you raise chickens, you'd be super psyched to see this post. You'd be psyched to share it with other people so they could understand your chicken raising life and what that's all about. Um, and so um, we've often found, we often found that even if, uh, groups that are relatively small um, really um, get excited when they have content that allows them to explain to other people their, their life or what they're, what they're about. Um, and then um, we, every year around the time when high schools do proms, BuzzFeed throws a queer prom for LGBTQ students that don't feel welcome at the prom at their own high school. Um, and I will just say, this, the prom that we throw is a lot better than any prom at any high school I've ever seen. Um, and, um, and we uh, you know, make videos and content around this and have kids come, we fly in um, kids from around the, around the country. Um, and this is a good example of a job of this makes me proud and it's a, a way of um, allowing people to, to really um, express their identity and, and be who they are. Um, and uh, you know, you know, one quote from a participant in the prom is, one thing that I'm going to take away from queer prom is that I'm normal. Um, so um, another, uh, another thing uh, that the, the internet needs more of is, is um, and the internet has been really good at, is it holding people accountable and exposing the truth. People, sh um, people spread m misinformation on the internet in a way that you really don't see in traditional media. But man, do people swoop in and start trying to correct those people and trying to tamp that down and trying to put um, better information out there. And I think that's a huge difference um, when you think about the way BuzzFeed News works. It's, a, it, it's that we're, we're engaged in the conversation on the internet and we are, are pushing forward to get to the bottom of what's going on, even when powerful people don't want you to know what's going on, even when people are trying to hide information from you. Um, one famous example um, is BuzzFeed uh, published the Trump uh, dossier, um, and this was something that, that, um, that other news organizations had read, that the president and the president-elect had been briefed on. It was something that the most powerful people in the country were, had, had seen and had access to, but the public didn't have access to it. It was affecting policy decisions. It was affecting um, um, the, the future of our country and of our democracy, and, and yet the public couldn't see it, and BuzzFeed made the decision to publish that document so that the public could see what was going on and understand what was, was happening in there, um, um, in, in, in the world and what was happening at the highest levels of government. Um, th this, I, I think, did a lot to open up reporting and help people figure out what was going on with the Trump-Russia connections. Um, 
We were sued for publishing it and won in summary judgment. Um, and I think it is a, a good example of, of a really um, making sure that even if powerful people don't want you to see something, the public deserves to see it. Um, and uh, we've also done other stories, like um, um, there was a crooked cop in Chicago who, was, who um, ended up putting many people in jail under, uh, with, uh, uh, um, you know, many innocent people in jail. And because of our reporting, we freed 10, 10, uh, 10 people and counting based on this reporting from, from prison. Um, and uh, more recently, um, we've done a lot of reporting uh, on the uh, Trump Tower Russia, uh, uh, the Trump Tower, the plan to build a Trump Tower in Moscow, um, which was something that um, we reported months before others. Um, and then also Trump directing um, Michael Cohen to lie to Congress. There's been various debate about how he directed him and was it implicit or explicit. Um, but as Michael Cohen's re uh, test recent testimony shows, um, many of the things that we that we published have have been confirmed um, that you know that that um, Trump Trump really intended for for uh, 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 or Michael Cohen had worked for Trump for many years and understood how Trump speaks and under and Michael Cohen's in, um, the thrust of our story was that Michael Cohen knew that Trump wanted him to lie and that he lied. Um, um, finally, another part of making good internet is not just um, advancing the truth and spreading the truth. It's um, looking at the evolution of the media. I don't believe that the way you make the internet great is nostalgic, you go back and you go back to the way the internet was in the past. Lots of things have happened, good and bad, and the point is we need to move forward to the things that are going to be more important in the future. The internet is a progressive medium that is always pushing forward into new things. And so when you look at the evolution of internet medium, media, in the early days, a lot of it was about views. So you think about Yahoo and um, you know, with, the, with impressions being the thing and page views being the thing. Then clicks became a deeper kind of action and activity. Um, Google search was all about clicks. Um, and then shares became something that became more meaningful with, with social and people being able to pass something on from, to, to a friend. Um, and then um, the thing that I feel like is really starting to define the media today is real world experiences, real world transactions, people doing things. Um, we have mobile devices, we're able to, to, to use our, our, our phones and use uh, the internet to actually buy things, to actually discover new things, to go places, to get off your phone and, get in, and, and do things in the, in the real world. It's a big thing that I think you're seeing across a lot of different um, parts, of, parts of, of, of media, and it's something that where BuzzFeed really thrives. We've been, no, we've been working on driving real world activity and action for, for a few years now, and I think we're seeing this trend really starting to hit a tipping point. Um, here's an example of, of, of a Bring Me video we published about a New York, uh, New York City cookie dough cafe um, where you can eat raw cookie dough in a cone, pasteurized, don't worry. Um, and we um, published this post and video, and, and then it resulted in lines around the block of people who had heard about this because of, of BuzzFeed's video. Um, and so this is an example of, you could look at another video that got, the, you know, a video that gets two million views or three million views, but then people watch it passively and forget about it. And you can look at a video that also has two million or three million views, and, and people see it and they say, I'm gonna spend my Saturday doing something, I'm gonna do a DIY project, I'm gonna go try something new that I haven't done before. There's a huge difference between those two kinds of media. And we need to get better at understanding what's the media that actually drives action in the world? What's the media that actually causes people to, to do things in the world? And we've been seeing again and again that there's ways to really drive activity in the world beyond just passive media consumption. Um, this is another great example. This is a, from a Nifty video where we taught people how to replant their food scraps. So we had food scraps from, from them, you know, after cooking, you can, um, follow the steps in this video to grow your own food in your kitchen. And we saw a flood of people doing this and growing their own food. But we also, um, but, but also even more uh, exciting to me is that a year later people are still posting about it and saying, look at, my, look at my tomatoes and I'm actually like waiting for my strawberries right now. I'm about to uh, eat the strawberries from this video from, from a year ago. Um, so a video that's not just about cons getting a lot of views or a lot of impressions, it's a video about really um, causing people to do something cool in their actual life in the real world. Um, 
Tasty is a real star at this kind of, of, of content. Um, so many people watch Tasty videos, um, sometimes just for entertainment, but a lot of people watch them to, because they want to cook them, uh, cook them, well, cook, cook food. Um, so um, them could be, well, I don't know. I, um, um, sometimes, uh, well, I, I, sometimes when you're just sort of talking, you sort of like lose track of what's going on. Then you say something, you think, did I just suggest cooking a person? And then you're like, no, probably not. Probably I'm the only one thinking that. <laughs> but then you still kind of want to correct it um, in case you did say that. So um, cooking food, um, not, not people. Um, so, so in this case, cheesecake. That's a good segue, cheesecake. Um, so if you look at this um, uh, a cheesecake recipe, um, we, you know, we, we saw um, lots of people make this, but not only did a lot of people make this particular recipe, it drove, um, huge, um, it drove huge sales of the springboard, the springform pan you need to grow it. It became the number one selling springboard pan in the country. Um, it also drove lots of sale, uh, sales of, of the tasty springboard pan, but also other people's springboard pans. Um, and so we're starting to be able to connect the dots between the media that you see online and the actual activities in the world, in this case through purchase, people purchasing a product at a much higher rate so they can make this uh, food and this dish. We also see in the Tasty app, which is really great if you're a cook, that there's um, a flood of tips for uh, every recipe where people are su making su suggestions of modifications and changes, and that's another way we get a signal into are people actually using this media to cook and, and to, um, to, to, to uh, um, take action in, in the world. Um, this is an example from our, from, um, our brand Pero Like. So we published a video about LA's only Puerto Rican food truck, and it turned out the business was actually struggling when we published the video. Um, and after publishing it, it became a tourist destination, and uh, of course people were, were from, from LA were going there as well, but people visited from as far as Alaska and Chicago, and it started to, and it really turned around their business um, and allowed them to expand their business um, and, and, and get back on track. So this is a, a great example of both um, the, like the, um, like the bring me example of people lining up around the block. This is an example where people lined up around the block and it also transformed the business of, the, of, this, of this food truck and helped these people build, uh, get their business um, back on the right track. So I think across all these examples you can see um, that there is um, something different about the, the internet and making internet media and we're here for South by Interactive and when, when we, we all should be working together to focus on how do you do things that really you can only do on the internet? How do you do things that make the internet better? How do you fight the, uh, against the dumpster fire and, and the bad stuff on the internet um, by supporting the things that, that matter and the things that we want to, to see in the future? Um, and so I think that what I would like to argue right now, even though it doesn't always seem like it, is that things are getting better. The platforms are, 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 are starting to value content more and are starting to pay more fairly for content. Digital business models are starting to evolve, and there's lots of innovative new models that can sustain um, uh, digital media companies. And the content that we're creating is the kind of content that you can only do on the internet and that connects with people in a deep way and gets people out of their house and gets people doing projects and um, helps um, people be part of the story and see themselves in media and engage in a deeper way. Um, so just because the internet can feel like this, um, it, it, it doesn't mean we should shy away. It doesn't mean we should say, you know what, like, I know that it's popular and trendy now to like quit, you know, social media or to sort of say that, you know, oh, it's, you know, like, like the internet's terrible or something like that. We can't give up. We have to keep fighting to make a great internet and there's a lot of, a lot of amazing things that are happening on the internet and there's a lot of amazing improvements that are happening on the internet and it's important that we and the industry has the optimism to fight for the things that we, we um, believe in and that we know and, and to build the, the internet that we want. Um, and I think the key to this is that we need more joy and truth on the internet. Um, these are two things that when I look over the years that, that, that really are sparks within BuzzFeed and sparks within the things that, that people love most about the internet. 
the, the internet meme that sparks joy, or the animated GIF that sparks joy, or the story that makes you um, uh, want to excitedly share it with your friend, and then the thing that ex tells you about the world and exposes uh, uh, the truth. These are things the internet is great at, and these are things the internet needs more of, and these are things that we shouldn't forget about. Um, and so let's all work together to save the internet. Let's work together to go down the right path, um, put out the dumpster fire, and, and you know, once the fire's out, we can put a lot of potting soil and maybe take scraps from our garden and use that to grow things in the dumpster. And then like years from now, you'll look at it and say, that's not a dumpster, that's a beautiful pot filled with like strawberries and, and oh, all right. Um, <laughs> I practiced that like 10 times, no, I actually, actually I didn't, I just made that up right now. Um, <laughs> so, um, so um, my, my, rec my, my uh, call to arms for everyone is spread joy and truth. Um, it's what the internet needs right now. Um, it's what the world needs. Um, and we can do it together. Um, and I think we're already seeing the way that brands are stepping up with, with um, um, helping support good content. The platforms are starting to, to pay more and, and, and take seriously content. Um, the digital media companies are, are starting to uh, build, build these uh, innovative new models and creating great content. And if we all work together, we are going to, to be able to build the internet that we want. Thank you. Um, So we have some time for questions, um, and um, I, can, uh, I can read some of the questions here. Let's see. Um, um, how do you draw the line? Okay, so, well, where are we? Okay, so here's a question. Uh, why did you um, choose to focus on viral content for BuzzFeed? It's often far from valuable journalism. Um, so, um, so good question. So, one of the things that I think um, is is uh, the reason why I think joy and truth are so important on the internet is that joy. Uh, a lot of what the internet is about is just a fun viral thing that you share with your friends, something that sparks joy, something that helps you see yourself in media. Um, and valuable journalism is um, is is something else that we do. And so, doing multiple things is is um, something that really every great media company does. Um, and so um, I think that you can create great entertainment that sparks joy and cr uh, do great journalism that, um, that, that um, informs the public. Um, so here's a question. You said that platforms should pay you, f oh, this is confusing to me. It, uh, it, yo, you said that platforms should pay you for the good content you create. Do you feel the same way about non-staff members who make quizzes for your site? Um, so that's a great question. So, um, we have a community section at BuzzFeed where anyone can come and make um, a quiz or a list, um, and we don't pay those people who, make, who, who participate in their community. Often they're um, students or, or people who are not very experienced, and a lot of why they do it, we actually did a survey of them, a lot of the, what they want is feedback from our staff, they want to improve, they want to learn, um, and they want to have an impact. Um, and a small percentage of them have, in, in, in the surveys we've done, have said that they want to be paid. Um, one of the things that we've noticed is that there was, a, there was a kind of famous story of a, of a student who was making quizzes for us, and some of them, uh, and it was making tons and tons of quizzes. A lot of those quizzes take a tremendous amount of work from our staff to, 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 to work on and create and, um, and co-create and, 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 and develop. Um, and so, um, um, the community has really been a huge place where we've been able to, to um, identify new talent. We've hired a lot of people who've come from the community. We've hired people both as freelance and full-time people who come from the community. And so when people reach a certain level um, and when they want some, to do something as a job, um, it, we, um, we have um, hired them you know, multiple occasions. Um, what is it? Oh, live questions, yes. Yeah, I'm Stop Bindle from the New House School at Syracuse University. Uh, in the fall, you did an interview with the New York Times talking about your openness to doing M&A activities with other digital media firms. Obviously, there's synergies in that front with like bargaining power with Facebook and Google, but I'm wondering if you could speak to maybe other synergies you see between uniting the digital media firms in the space that you thought should be potentially united. 
Yeah, so if you, if you look back at the cable industry in, say, the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of, of, of the power dynamic was more equal, where the, the, the media networks and the cable operators were both really big businesses and had more equal power. And so they could negotiate um, essentially fair rates for creating content for, their, the, the, for the, for the uh, cable networks. Um, one of the challenges I think you see in digital media right now is that uh, the, the um, tech platforms are so big, they're the biggest companies in the world, um, and the digital media companies are more fragmented. And so creating more balance, I think, would allow for more creative tension and, more, and, and better business um, um, dynamics. Um, so that's sor sort of the thinking around it. However, I would say that since that article um, uh, talking about the idea of media consolidation and digital, um, I think that, that the big platforms have started uh, to realize that they have other incentives to pay fairly, um, and a lot of it I talked about today. If, if um, they don't uh, um, create an environment where good content can flourish, there's a fear that they'll be regulated, there's a fear that they won't be able to control the content, there's a fear of endless cycles of bad press um, because of the content on their platforms. So I think it's actually possible that, that you don't need to consolidate the digital media industry in order to, to have the platforms become good partners. Um, so I don't think it's a necessary thing, and it's a, a kind of thing that I would, I would look at if it made sense for BuzzFeed, but it's not something that I feel like we have to do in any, in any sense. Hi. My name is Dominic, German Public Broadcasting. I have a question about responsibility when you do stories that impact the real world. As you gave us the example of the food truck in LA, I was wondering how sustainable is their newfound success and whose responsibility is that? Is it, is it theirs or is BuzzFeed responsible to do like, I don't know, a, a follow-up story of their success or is it going to be all up to them? Yeah, I, I certainly don't think we're responsible for the, the long-term uh, success of their, of their food truck, but I think people discovering that they have great food and discovering that, that, that it's something worth their time is really a big part of what, of what BuzzFeed can do and other media companies can do. Discovering new things and, and uh, new things that spark joy and is, a, is a big role that the media has had for, for you know, many years. Hello, well done, Jonah. My name's Jules, I'm with Tribe Influencers. I'm fascinated in the BuzzFeed Creator Network. Can you expand on that? And, Obviously, creators mean a lot of different things. It can mean people with five million followers. It can mean people that do six-minute videos, uh, contributors in blogs. Um, what are they creating? Yeah, so all the creators at BuzzFeed are actual producers. They make videos. They are people who, who have full-time jobs at BuzzFeed for, for um, you know, making content and, and are really great content creators. Um, and, and that creates a real advantage because they actually know how to do more than just a direct-to-camera video. They, they have a much, more, uh, a, a much bigger arsenal of things that they're able to do. Um, I would also say that sometimes independent creators um, need to pay their rent that month, and so they'll, they'll endorse a product that they maybe don't actually like or don't care about. By having a big pool of, of, of people at BuzzFeed in this program, when a brand wants to partner with us, we can talk to different creators and find people who genuinely like the brand and genuinely want to be associated with the brand, and we can then come up with a concept for the media that we make with them, and then distribute that media across BuzzFeed and Tasty and Nifty and Goodful and, and, and all of our, our different brands and our media networks. So it's, it's a powerful combination of what's really strong about influencer-type marketing and what's really strong about a uh, digitally native um, um, media company that can, that can reach a big audience. Excellent, thank you. So let's do the one, like, one last question. Um, my name is Ulrike. Uh, two questions. Uh, first is, is your, <laughs> is your optimism um, justified in terms of digital media revenue getting better? I mean, BuzzFeed is a good example of, uh, you had to downsize, you had to lower revenue projections. That's question one. Question two is um, subscriptions and premium content for that is being paid for by the audience is now the latest fad. Um, are you considering that route? Yeah, so the optimism, um, I think, is warranted in that we've had a shift in the industry where a couple years ago, a lot of things were being funded by venture capital. And so people were focused on growth and trying to get as big as possible. During that period, we outran the competition and became the biggest digital media company. 
Um, and now I think people are focused on, um, on outlasting the competition and building sus for sustainability. So there's less uh, investor money, there's less venture capital, and businesses are focused on running like real, real businesses and being profitable and focusing on, um, on, on, on uh, long-term sustainability. And so um, BuzzFeed has gone through that transition, and a lot of other media companies have gone that th through that transition. Um, I also would say there was a lot of, of hope that the platforms would step up and start to pay more for content, and it took a little bit too long, but now we're really seeing it start to happen, so that's another reason for optimism. Um, the fact that there's been a long delay caused a lot of people to lose faith, but the fact that it's starting to happen now shows that now's the time to actually really um, can, um, take advantage of that, of, of that trend. Um, and then in terms of subscription, I think that um, for me it's important um, for, for mission-driven reasons to reach a broad public with our content. We reach hundreds of millions of people. Um, and subscription isn't something we would do with our entire company, the way some companies have turned everything they do into a subscription service. Um, it could be a, a product or a feature that we do in some places, but we want to inform the broad public and create uh, great content for, for, for the audience um, wherever they are across the global internet. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, have a great rest of your South Bye.